Chapter 58 to 59. Jojo and Rhea 6. King X King X King 1. Once again the gang marched on. It took Medb and Rhea a while to get accustomed to the new member, but Zell soon proved to be incredibly useful in terms of magical assistance. He was a bit of a joker, but never to the point of drawing people to madness with his pranks and antics. He was a comedian at heart, but there were also times where jokes could end up taking them to unplanned trips across the cosmos. Such as when an experiment from our gang's mage resulted in a blinding white light which did nothing. Like, absolutely nothing. They were still in the same forest we had been wandering in a while, just a few miles off from home. It was quite the odd development since something usually happened during these times. Heck, it became such an expected situation that Med no longer screamed at the sight of demons trying to bypass the realm of space slash time. Yet, while at first they were confident things had remained unchanged, their expectation changed when they started to wander off to get back to Londinium and, they were soon dangling off the ground through some ropes-related trap that snapped on them. Med beeped loudly as she moved to keep her dress from folding and show off any unwarranted exposure. Rhea groaned as she started to cut into the ropes, surprised when more ropes seemed to form with each one she would end up cutting. Jojo blinked at the sight and turned his attention to their only expert on the case. He could sense something was wrong in the force. Cell analysis. It would seem we have been captured by unknown forces, boss. The magician hummed as he was quite at ease compared to the rest. I would also dare to say something about this dimension is wrong. T this dimension? What do you mean? Rhea half shrieked, flaying Excalibur with growing unease. And what is wrong with these ropes? Zelrich opened his mouth to reply to that, but he was cut short by another voice. The ropes are meant to keep on strapping on you until I so decide to free you four from this trap, a short girl remarked flatly, handling her peculiar staff with incredible ease despite it being a most heavy contraption. Still, I'm confused. How come you feel more like kingly figures than mere adventurers? I'm King Joseph of Britannia, Jojo introduced himself without hesitation, soon followed by Medb. Queen Medb of Connaught, prettiest pink cat in Ireland. But there aren't many pinkets in Ireland, Medb. Jojo argued, only to get a huff from the girl and a pout. I'm the prettiest pinkette here, the short girl rebuked with some annoyance. Names have a trot. Zelrich, I like to play things with dimensional barriers. And I'm Arthur Pendragon, king of Britons. King of what? Britons? Britannia? That's preposterous. Morgan is the ruler of these lands. The Fays are in charge, not humans, Habitrot remarked, staring at them with disbelief and they returned that glance with equal confusion. Morgan? Rhea inquired with a shocked tone. I'm quite sure she is still imprisoned, Jojo assured. This dimension, wait, you mentioned Faze were in charge, right? What about Mab and Oberon? Hmm, that's a bit of a troublesome history to remember, but I know only that Morgan and the fairy clans are now in charge of the English realm, the short Pinkette assured. In fact, this whole situation is quite unexpected. A different dimension? That's quite absurd to believe, but I can tell you are not lying. Your swords aren't. The ropes untangled and soon they were all falling on the ground. Zell landed smoothly while Med managed to use a nearby tree to stabilize and slow down her fall. Rhea fell onto a soft and pillowed section of the ground, which turned out to be a groaning Jojo as he had fallen down face first and provided Rhea a way to not get hurt in a similar way. Eh, sorry. Jojo mumbled something close to it is all right or then stop putting your weight on my back. It took them a while to recollect themselves and soon a wider interaction with the mysterious face started regarding the events that transpired in recent times. It felt just so absurd to imagine that the situation could be so radically different from the one back home. Morgan was queen? Londinium had been destroyed? And what's this about the world slowly coiling towards England and preparing to kill off most of life in it? It wouldn't take them long to be brought in proximity to see that they were quite close to Camelot right now and, it felt different to glance at it. It looked grayer than before, as if something had drawn most of the colors out of it. Rhea's face showed no emotion, but just a glance to her beloved city showed the flaws with it in this dimension. It lacked the warm colors, the feeling, the humanity, and Jojo was patting her shoulder before that scene. Morgan, what did you do? The blonde muttered in dismay. The knights, her children, where's Merlin and me? I don't think your counterpart is gone and, that jerk wizard is too cheeky to die, Jojo assured with genuine hopefulness. Trust me, they will be all right. Yeah, Medb assured. I bet your other self is around kicking baddies butts right now and claiming names? Definitely claiming butts too, Jojo confirmed mirthfully, before looking a bit further on Camelot. You think that she got someone defending it? Like knights as strong as Lancelot or her children? She has her fairy knights, Habitrot remarked, drawing their attention back to her. They are considered the strongest warriors, and one of them is her heiress so, if you plan to do something about this, I request you keep up some caution on the matter. We'll not break things, Med promised, before allowing her smile to grow. Much. The short Fay groaned and shook her head at the notion that she may as well introduce some world-enders to the closest path to cause the most havoc. Sadly for her, the situation would soon escalate to a greater length, with revelations, ambitions, pinkets clashing in the name of their ideals, heavy head padding sessions, and a throne that was now representing the reason driving two kings to clash against a fellow one. From a tale of two, this story would soon shift to one between three kings. A smug chad, a reasonably cautious blonde, and a very cunning and bored silver-haired queen. Oh make end. The next morning was particular. I wasn't exactly sure how to properly react to all of this. I didn't exactly see a major issue with it beyond having to speak with Maya about her current plotting without me knowing what she was doing. At this point, I could tell my sweet wife was getting a bit too taken by the notion of setting me with others. I didn't see it as her trying to really go through a duty, there was a form of amusement in pranking me that way. 
That and being part of said pranks herself if possible. That breakfast highlighted how endeared the woman was to see our reaction after the cheeky plot she concocted. Scathack was the calmest and the happiest of the group if her lingering smirk was something to go with. Lucy had just ditched any plans to appear stoic or annoyed, her face stuck in a permanent nervous blush which was further heightened by Maya's giggles. The Pope was still resting while we were having that meal, so we were mostly in private when this whole situation unfolded. The knights were here too, and I was slowly growing convinced that Maya had bribed them into silence. Somehow. Dear, I believe we have much to talk about after we're done eating, I hummed calmly, making an effort to keep my cool despite the awkwardness of the circumstance. The woman just gave me a smile. Sure thing, my love dot. She was way too excited about this, and I have to say it had to do with how we ended up solving that skirmish. Hugging to each other, cuddling in the bed and her listening to why I was a bit disappointed about this. Yes, I may have considered doing something in that regard after what happened with Rhea and Guinevere, but I felt a bit used when it came to being subjected to what happened the previous night without any warning. My wife listened and admitted she had been a bit too pushy in that regard. I could tell that due to her pregnancy her emotions had been hitting high points out of nowhere. She didn't cry or anything, but she felt extremely sad because she knew she made a mistake by not bringing me up to date with that sort of plan. It was an attempt to give me something nice, but the way things developed remarked how I should have been given a clue on what she had in mind to the very least. Still, no harm and no foul in that regard. Except Morgan seemingly picking up something had happened from the way Scathack smiled smugly at her if she was around while I would go to visit the older Pendragon. She would eye me oddly and then proceed to behave quite crankily until it was just her and me. I wasn't sure how to handle that, and I really hoped Maya wasn't going to catch any wind of this whole matter and suggest a repeat of that interesting night. Between solving personal circumstances, handling the last months of pregnancy for Maya, and getting a few plans set in motion to have an army in the continent the moment Odoacer tried something funny, I found some time to actually accommodate a visit from Mab. I had invited the Fae Queen after thoroughly checking the matter tied to Oberon and making sure nothing suspicious would come my way the moment I focused on the matter tied to him, his former wife, and Titania. The ensuing meeting was somewhat tense as Mab was quite stubborn in keeping things unknown for a time, but she confessed the truth and it left me stunned by the sheer BS I was listening to. Of all possible circumstances, this one was perhaps the one thing that I couldn't fault Uther about. Sure, he may have given the order to find a way to get Oberon to support him and his heir, but Mab confirmed that this plan was made by Merlin without asking for any input from Rhea and Morgan's father. What? I replied smartly, my brain short-circuiting before the sheer insanity I'd just heard. Merlin was the one that created the need for me to trick my own husband. He told me how Oberon would have instantly known it was an illusion, that Titania was just a false interpretation of his desires and not the truth. Or maybe that I was his Titania all along and he would have loved me more. The woman reasoned with a quiet tone, pain filling her words. I was foolish, expecting something that wasn't true. Did he even love me? Did I even love him? You definitely did if you were willing to see that love of yours grow, I reckoned and she sighed. It's not that simple, the Fae argued softly. I was driven by the passion of knowing my lover loved me without any chance of ever leaving me. Yet he did. He forgot me and I failed him by accepting to test how true his intentions were. As she silently mourned over it, I took a moment to study what I just heard. Mab created Titania herself because Memelin wanted these two to break up. He knew it would have succeeded, but he didn't tell her how to draw that entity. Which left me wondering how she created Titania if she wasn't given points to rely on. How did you know at the time that Titania was his ideal partner in life? Why were you sure he would have seen you as her? Her lips twitched, a hand of confusion dripping from her melancholic mood. How? I suppose it's because Titania was born from how I once was when we first met. It was different times, different ideals and a rough patch in our lives. You were a warrior? I pressed on, starting to see a pattern there. Yes, I suppose I was that with my limited action in combat, the woman confirmed and I felt the dots slowly connect. And you were bolder than you are now. Impulsive even. Yes, but how does that help with the situation? Mab inquired. How would that explain anything if Dash? He misses old you, I blurted out, causing the queen to pause and frown at me. Beg your pardon? You formed Titania from your younger self, with all those elements, qualities and flaws, that you no longer have or, at least, show to anyone anymore, I started to elaborate. So, perhaps, he is not seeing her in you because you have somewhat outgrown that kind of person. You have changed from that kind of individual. Why yes, but dash. And that could be the issue. Not just him being unable to remember you like that, but you missing some of the fun parts of that old self of yours. The woman tensed up. I don't understand. Well, why pick Titania of all people? Why not the benevolent queen you are right now? I asked back, knowing she was withholding. I mean, you are making a point in rekindling your love with him, and that's what many women trying to get back to their old more adventurous selves tend to say when trying to spice up a relationship. Her face burned red at that uncensored remark. I definitely hit the spot, and she hadn't expected for anyone to be as direct as I was. P perhaps, but still I failed in that. I can't get him back now that dash. I think the best way to handle that, to make him see and snap him out of his illusion, is to go to him and show him the real Titania. Humab giving me a very long look which alternated from initial conclusion to slow realization as my words dawned on her about what I was telling her. You want me to go to him and be like that? Try and be like I once was. I bet that's still there. You never lost that Titania, and you just put her aside to handle your duties. And I think now it's a good reason to bring her up to handle this mess you made. You, you are right, Mab agreed, her tone showing something that has been missing for a while now. Hope. I will apologize, I will tell him the truth, 
And I will do everything he needs me to do to get what I destroyed even if it means becoming a queen consort to him. That was a strong proclamation, coupled with her wings starting to buzz like crazy. Were Faye's wings even meant to shift that fast and intensely? I could tell she was planning to make a fly for it, so I tried to ask a question in that regard. Do you want me to open the window or are you going to leave through dash? Crash. The stairs. I ended with a flat tone as Mab just rushed through the window and proceeded to soar into the general directions of where Oberon was. I was quiet for a while, but then a small group of guards entered with Lancelot. Am I king? What happened? I may have enabled a Fae Queen's repressed hot-bloodedness into hunting down her husband and fixing things up with him. I got quite the interesting mashup of reaction by answering that question. I didn't hear much from Mab for the next couple of days, but soon she sent me a letter telling me how she was working to patch things up with her husband. Sounds like they were going for a second honeymoon period or something and I got many thanks from the couple for helping them fix things up. I really need to get that whole therapist plan going fast if that's how easily this kind of problem could be solved. Really, I bet that could spare some tragedies from happening. The next few weeks proved to be quite interesting for British affairs in terms of political developments. The Pope's interest to finally meet Arthur got him a rendezvous with Rhea in Camelot as I had convinced the blonde to give it a try and speak with him. If not to see what kind of person this individual was, to actually get a papal blessing in her rule. If she did that, the various obstacles posed by the various vassals in her kingdom would be dimmed long enough for her to go through the plans we had for Ireland. The encounter was actually one of the most amusing possible. I think Felix was quick to see how humble and polite Rhea was and I also noticed she was slightly taller than last time I saw her for some odd reasons. I didn't ask her about it as I thought it was just my eyes playing tricks on me. I didn't question the blonde about it, focusing on handling the conversation itself. The Pope supported Rhea's own desire and commended her for handling the tedious tasks of such an imperfect kingdom and blessed him to remain in power for as long as the Lord gave her the chance to. The proclamation was heard by many and it had some interesting effects on how things developed back to Camelot. Nobles were more courteous, less complicated, to deal with and were willing to finally fund through donations in weapons the army Rhea had prepared for our combined operations. And even there, we were surprised by a few details I hadn't taken into account that made the whole operation less taxing and less aggressive in nature before the eyes of the natives and those back home. The invasion of Ireland was less of an invasion and more of a liberation. Artoria's papal blessing scored her the sympathy and the loyalty of the King of Lygin, Crimthan Mackinai. The man hailed from the UI Chancellor Accept and had been baptized by St. Patrick. His commitment to Christianity matched his respect for traditions. He saw Rhea as a unifying figure and one that had enough power to secure the whole island, spare it from the many years of disorder it had been suffering and perhaps provide them with a comfortable blanket against any raiders. This submission was also matched by Yangus MacNad Froich and Myrdak Muenderg, the kings of Kazel, modern-day Munster, and Ilaid, modern-day Ulster, respectively. The three kings were willing to accept Rhea's supreme ruler with conditions more restrictive than the vassals she currently had in exchange of recognizing both religious claims from the old Celtic septs and those supporting Christianity within the island. Ireland was conquered in under two months and Rhea was proclaimed high king through a coronation in Ilaid. Celebrations ensued, efforts to send loyal governors from Camelot through Ireland provided her with the means to intervene in the modernization of agriculture and infrastructure. She copied a few of my original plans, but added some modified versions through consulting with the local rulers of the Irish regions, getting a clear understanding on how to implement a few reforms without damaging the current terrain and agricultural output. And with this show of political might beyond military capacity as she was shown riding around the battlefields while using Rongaminiad to tear apart her foes, many vassals back home were quick to fall back in line. Galehot was among those that did so as the campaign started, impressed by his king's current approach and finally seeing a proper ruler in Arthur. All in all, Rhea saw this as an absolute win. And while we did meet a few times after that conquest, I couldn't help but notice that our rendezvous were getting less frequent. I thought it was just her trying to keep things cool after Guinevere's announced pregnancy to avoid getting caught in what really happened, but I could tell there was more to it. I didn't inquire as maybe it was tied to how busy she got with handling both Camelot and Irish affairs. Still, nothing to complain about. For now. Three months later, things had taken a rather bizarre turn. Odoacer had started to assemble troops at the Gallian borders with the intent of claiming some of the former Visigoths' lands for Rome. The lack of a religious leader in Rome despite his best effort to have a new religious man elected as the new pope was tied to Felix III excommunication crippling his legitimacy in supporting any new elected holy man and to the Byzantine refusal to concede to a rebellious barbarian kingdom. Conflicts had erupted between their borders, but it had all been skirmishes. Same in Gallia, except those were even more decentralized and happening as isolated cases. This time around, Odoacer wanted to expand and he expected to actually get a victory by shredding enough armies off the border. When the news reached Valia, the response was clear, it was time to assemble and get ready to smash through the gates. A plan that was received positively by all kingdoms. With Suebia Iberica consolidating and having slightly expanded by acquiring some of the Moroccan and Algerian coasts and the Frankish kingdom having the Saxons and the Marcomanni, everyone was much stronger and ready to strike. And, from what I got from Rhea, she was planning to take part in this fight too, which would be the first time in several weeks since I last saw her. Through this lengthy time period, many things have changed back in the dual kingdom. Mostly for the good. The Pope had grown to love Britain and had visited the other Christian kingdoms that supported him to bless the rulers and some of their goodwilled reforms. 
He was beloved as a popular pope, something that some of the traditional entourage saw with some unease as it marked the end of the hold the old pontificate had over the church's traditional rules. The moment Felix sat down in Rome to resume his rule, things were going to change for Christianity as a whole, and I was sure he had plenty of influence to slowly phase British Chalcedonian into the Roman doctrine. Seeing how this event had been long predicted, I didn't need to mobilize an army and hurry to get into Gallia as we already had a large detachment sitting in Normandy that had been training up to this point. The commander I sent? Lancelot. It had been difficult to get him to accept the lengthy commission, but he accepted when I mentioned he was the man I trusted the most with that sort of affair. Plus, he would be seen as a tolerable choice compared to others due to his Gallian upbringing. He was a bit upset, he was also given orders to mingle with some of the local nobility and ended up getting entangled with a particular noble lady that ended up ensnaring him. He sounded like he was genuinely forced into this, but I suggested he could handle the locals with more tact and that his knighthood wasn't one that enforced chastity, so if he felt the need to explore a relationship with anyone he was free to consider these options. Turns out that just a moment of submission to his desire ended up with him putting a baby in Elaine of Corbenic, with his soon-to-be father-in-law more than happy to fully pay for a marriage if necessary. I think he developed a wild case of cold feet at this as he requested to bail from his role the moment the news rolled in. My response, don't you dare make me go there and kick your ass. Men up, take responsibility and be a proper father for your kid. After all this news reached me just as I got notified by both Scathack and Lucy that both were expecting too. I wasn't sure if it was during that first time together or the couple others that ensued next, but that was it. And it happened just after just some time Maya had delivered my first son and current heir. Little boy with a small hint of dark hair on top of his head and ruby-like eyes akin to his mother. It felt like back when I held Mordred, yet the feeling was somewhat more intense. Speaking of the little blonde, the girl was staring at her little brother with delight together with Lyanna. The redhead witnessed the scene with one of the happiest looks her face could muster. Gabriel Arcadius Bukharin, welcome to this world, and I'm sorry you're going to be overwhelmed by the clearly higher female rate of this family's ratio. Poor kid's going to get lots of love and teasing. Still, this new affair in Italia had my full attention as I could finally rely on some changes on the current warfare. Studies on an air force had just produced changes in the air balloon's effort, creating zeppelins. While one could envision this as a take on the World War I design used for those, the thing was that those were more rudimentary in nature and relied heavily on wind manipulation and energy production allowed through special runes and magical batteries. The runes would convert wind slash air in prana and then use it to fuel the entire structure. For this reason, those were just one-fourth in size compared to the first original zeppelin and their role was strictly stuck to troops' transportation. A few were provided to the other kingdoms with some technicians sent to train engineers in these areas to handle the vehicles with caution. No accident had occurred with those, yet, but a careful approach was still used when locating large numbers of troops around. I was going to wait for Rhea to get her army assembled and ready to relocate before going to Gallia, and I was really curious to see how this could have developed into something fairly interesting since she had never used one of those before. I was really looking forward to this war to start and end as quickly as possible, set things up in Italy and then make sure things were cool with Byzantium, and that we weren't trying to reclaim old Rome but create a new one. To reform the empire under a new governance just like some of the late imperial era's emperors did when the land became too difficult for a single man to handle. I doubted we were going to score an immediate friendship, but expectation was to at least secure something similar to a non-aggression pact. It was too extended of an empire for a war to be won to the fullest, so any conflict with Constantinople was still going to end in some minor victory no matter the efforts spent in it. There was just too much land to deal with. But for now, let us reclaim Rome and end the age of migration for good.